So I don't think I have to tell any of you about the value of the research that you do, the classes that you teach, or the students that you mentor. But I think it's fair to say that we all know that not everybody speaks that language. What most people understand at the end of the day is money. And so to frame a little bit about what we do, I wanted to talk about economics. And if you've been to a Coast meeting before, so this may seem familiar, but we have more recent numbers, and I think it's a pretty strong argument. So California's ocean economy in 2013, which is the last year for which we have data, is made up of these sectors listed here at the bottom of the slide. And in 2013, it was valued at over $44 billion. When you add in indirect revenue, so that's all the revenue associated with these sectors, that number will double to close to $90 billion. However, California has a coastal economy which is all of the revenue that's generated in the 19 counties along the coast and around San Francisco Bay. And that coastal economy is significantly larger. In 2013, 75% of the state's residents lived in those 19 coastal counties. And they generated $1.9 trillion in revenue. So that's all the activity, again, that occurs in those coastal counties because people want to live there because of the climate, because of the lifestyle, because everyone else is there, so there are jobs. So $1.9 trillion was 86% of the state's gross domestic product that year, and it's equal to 11% of the state's GDP. So I think it's fair to say that the, the health and well-being of our coast and ocean are extremely critical to the overall economic well-being of the state and the nation. And so that's always an argument that you can come back to for the value of what we do. It really helps benefit the state in a number of ways. <clears throat> So, as Zed mentioned, or maybe it was Ganesh, I'm sorry. Uh, if you don't know, the CSU is the largest publicly funded university system in the country. We have 23 campuses, over 450,000 students, over 22,000 faculty members. And we're spread along the campus from San Diego in the south to Humboldt in the north. Within the context of that, COAST is now the official organization for marine, coastal, and coastal watershed related research. And Zed alluded to this. Most of you don't know about this, but even though Coast has been around for eight years, we weren't official. So even though we've been getting money, we went through a process over the last 12 months and we have now gotten the official stamp of approval and can operate on behalf of the CSU and use that name. So I guess we've been doing so illegally for a while. But we are the organization for marine, coastal, and coastal watershed research within the CSU. What we work to do is promote research and education to advance our knowledge of coastal and marine resources and the processes that affect them. Coast includes the open and coastal ocean, coastal zones such as bays, estuaries, and beaches, and coastal watersheds to the extent that they articulate with the coast at some point. So this could be any organism, material, or process that affects the coast or ocean or is affected by the coast and ocean. So this hasn't always been abundantly clear in the past, but I want to be very clear now. The coast will entertain project, any coastal watershed projects where the connection with the coast at some point, the relevance to coast's overall mission can be articulated. I also want to stress that the work that we support is not limited to California. This has also always not been clear in the past, for which I apologize. We do support a lot of work in California because many of you are working in California, but we also support projects by faculty members and students throughout the world. So if you're interested in pursuing funding for that type of work, please let me know. Um, I was going to talk just briefly about some of our numbers, specifically revenue and then our spending on CSU faculty members and students. So COAST is a very CSU-centric organization. We are funded by annual contributions from the Chancellor's Office and individual contributions from the campuses. And then all of our money every year goes back into CSU faculty members and students. If you remember in the beginning, Coast was much smaller back when we started in 2008, 2009. We got a big bump in the third year of our program, 2010, 2011, when Chancellor Reed increased his annual contribution from 200,000 to 500,000. And that, along with the campus contributions, got us to 663, which is where we were three years ago. We had additional growth in 2014-15 with increases in revenue from both the campuses and the Chancellor's Office. And now the Chancellor's Office contribution is tied to the Higher Education Price Index, which is about it was 3%. For last year's budget, it'll be about 2.2% for this year. So it's basically higher education inflation. So the Chancellor's Office contribution is now tied to that, so we can expect at least small increases for the foreseeable future. Con 
concomitantly, our spending on grants and awards for CSU faculty <coughs> members and students has also increased as well. And you can see the numbers here that we've significantly increased not only the amount of money that we invest in faculty and students annually, but also the overall percentage of our budget dedicated to grants and awards has gone up. We've tried to be very responsive to, to what the faculty and students seem to need and how we can best meet that need. <coughs> Okay, uh, well, just, I mean, just coffee, not anything stronger. Okay, first I'm gonna talk about faculty support. As many of you know, we have a variety of different types of programs that we've evolved to support faculty members in different ways with different amounts of money, and I'm gonna talk briefly about each of these. Right now, uh, many of you may be very familiar with the grant development program because proposals are due on Monday. Last year, we awarded $86,000 through this program. I expect that we will award more this year. Um, and this is a program designed to help faculty generate preliminary data or give them time to write more successful proposals that hopefully will result in significant extramural funding. And to date, this program has been very successful generating over a 10 to 1 return on investment for the amount of money we've invested in the faculty. I put these pictures up just to show you that yes, we do fund work outside of California, so right now we're funding a geological study in the Bay of Bengal. And also this picture here, I think this is from California. This might be, where's Amy? Does this reckon, is this your picture? I think it is. <laughs> to show you too that we're supporting research in a variety of different areas, including geology, computer science. This is a model of, this is a three-dimensional model of tidal flow in San Diego Bay that um, Mary Thomas in the back is part this project so it's not just fish and algae and marine mammals we're trying to reach faculty and engage faculty in a variety of different departments and I think we're seeing that we have Sen Chow here from meteorology at San Jose we have Amy Gussick who's a new faculty member in anthropology um, we want to engage faculty members in engineering mathematics computer science geology geography really across the board <clears throat> We also have a rapid response funding program that's designed to help faculty get short-term, smaller amounts of funding for research that's extremely timely or urgent. So in a situation where you can't wait for the annual grant development program call for proposals, you could apply to the rapid response funding program. And so we had um, a number of proposals this year. This was the second year of the program. The first year we only made three awards. This year we made eight. And there were a number of things happening in California that needed urgent responses. So we still had the sea star wasting disease. We had the refugio oil spill last May. We funded several projects related to that, and there were predictions for a very strong El Nino. So last or this year, we originally had about twenty-seven thousand dollars available for rapid response. There was, but there was an incredible demand, and we had some extra money that we were able to reallocate and increase the pot to over fifty-five thousand dollars. Another program we have that I want to talk about is the Seminar Speaker Series program. And this is also in its second year. We developed this because we were aware that a lot of departments had either no budgets or very small budgets to bring in seminar speakers from outside the immediate area. And the goal of this program is to get CSU faculty moving around among the campuses and, and spending time together, which I think helps develop relationships. So your department can apply for small amounts of money. It's, it's $700 or $1,000 if you're from Humboldt or going up to Humboldt. But you can bring someone in from another CSU campus to speak at your weekly seminar series or whatever you have. And you can have, you know, you pay for their travel costs and have them spend the night so that you can spend the whole day together and either work on something that you want to collaborate on or just get to know each other and possibly collaborate down the road. So, we got a lot of people moving around this year. A lot of campuses benefiting from this. I really strongly encourage you to take a look at this. Um, I think, do we have it open for next year? Okay, we don't have it open for next year, <laughs> but you're probably planning right now for next fall. And so we'll get this up in the next few weeks. Um, I think it's not a very onerous application, but you can, get, you can pretty easily get the money to bring someone in from another campus and really develop a more, a more full relationship out of this, which I like people having FaceTime, that's why we have the annual meeting and spend lots of time during this meeting eating lunch together, eating breakfast together. Um, we've already had a couple different proposals or plans to develop projects further come out of just these, these little tiny visits. So I think that this is not a lot of money but can have a big impact. So please consider taking advantage of that. Okay. We also have some 
something called the Strategic Investment Program, which we did not fund this year, but we funded it at the end of 2014-15. So I want to talk about it because these are long-term projects that are still going on. And tomorrow, the Executive Committee and co-staff are meeting to work on our budget for next year, 2016-17, and we'll have to make decisions about whether or not we're going to offer this again. So we've only offered this once. Um, we put, we made two awards that together total $65,000, and the maximum award amount is $45,000. So these are the largest awards Coast has made to date. And they're designed not to fund a faculty member or faculty members for their own individual research projects. It's to really help build capacity within the CSU. So we want to fund groups of faculty members from multiple campuses or different disciplines who want to go after larger extramural funding to really increase the capacity of the CSU. So this could be to obtain equipment or establish a center, for example. One of the first groups we funded was the Moss Landing Marine Lab Center for Aquaculture. And so even though it's headquartered at Moss Landing, the team is led by faculty from San Diego State, San Jose State, Moss Landing, and CSU East Bay. And so they're working to develop the infrastructure for the center that ultimately will be a resource for all of the CSU, the aquaculture industry, and the state agencies. They had a meeting in January at Moss Landing with representatives from throughout the system, as well as the industry partners and some of the state regulators, and I think it was a great first step. So they're continuing to write proposals and try to get extra mural funding and outside investment to advance this for all of us. <clears throat> The other group that we started funding last year is led by faculty members at San Luis Obispo, San Francisco, and um, Fresno, with participation from other campuses throughout the entire system, including East Bay, Dominguez Hills, Long Beach, Monterey Bay, and Sonoma in particular. So they're planning to meet this summer to, to draft um, an NSF research coordination network proposal. And the overall idea is how you use information from genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, to really put the organism back together again and understand what some of these impacts are on the population as a whole or even the ecosystem. So if you're in, it's a lot of ecophysiology, but they want to include various levels of biology and model up through the system. So those are things we're looking for big results for. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about for faculty um, is an opportunity that we offered this year for the first time. We have not had any takers. So we're going to roll the money over and offer it next year, and I do hope that we get some interest. So COAST wants to facilitate the development of hosting and hosting of short courses, workshops, or symposia on any topic related to COAST. And so you can apply for funding. You can take release time if you need to, theoretically, to... Hi, Jeff. We're going to, have, we're going to put you down here in the front, so you're welcome to walk around. This is Jeff Crooks. He's one of our panelists from the Tijuana Estuary Research Reserve. Welcome. Um, so again, we'll put the RFP back out for the 2016-17 academic year. Um, and you know, when we've talked about this, there's a lot of things we envision. Maybe you want to have a short course on marine mammal physiology. Maybe you want to get together experts in the field to talk about what we know about sea star waste and disease at the moment. Maybe you want to have a hands-on workshop to teach people about a specific technique that they can use to augment their research. So we want this to benefit faculty and students throughout the CSU, but also external stakeholders. This is a chance to show off the expertise that the CSU has. Um, do you want to come down here? Come down here. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to put you on the spot. We'll have you sit over there next to Steve Wirtz. You, that's our panel now here. Thank you. Um, so I hope that this is of interest to you. Um, as I said, we did not get any applications this first year, but it takes time sometimes to generate interest in something. So if this is something you're interested in pursuing for the coming year, please let me know. We look forward to helping fund these types of activities. I think it would be great for our faculty and students to be able to participate in these things, and COAST really wants to help sponsor them. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk about student support now. We also have a variety of programs that support students throughout the system, both undergraduate and graduate students, for slightly different purposes. I want to talk about the Grad Student Research Awards this year. So we received, I think, close to 90 complete eligible applications and made a total of 36 graduate student awards. They're $3,000 each, so that was a total investment of $108,000. 
The students can use this money to fund their research or to use to help defray their living expenses while they're students. Um, we got applications from 15 campuses and made awards to students at 12 campuses. And I know there's a couple campuses that don't have grad programs, but I do strongly encourage you to be talking to your students about this program when it's announced, which is every year in August. Applications are due at the end of October. And um, <coughs> while, there's, while we are pretty maxed out at capacity with the number of applications we get, many of you serve as reviewers, for which I want to thank you. Um, <laughs> and that's a big effort. But I would like to see the overall participation in this program increase. I would like to see um, more applications. Um, I think it's fairly competitive already, so with a success rate probably of close to 40% this year. Um, but this is something that is a great opportunity for students to get a little bit of money that can really help fund their graduate student research. <clears throat> we also provide travel funding to students. So if students are attending a meeting or a conference, and they're going to present the results of original coastal marine or coastal watershed related research, we can help them get there. Um, we provided a total of about $33,000 in travel funding so far this year, and we actually have a little bit of money still left for travel in May and June of this year. Um, we take the money for the entire year and divide it up into quarters so that money is available throughout the entire year and that students who come near the end of have travel near the end of the fiscal year aren't out of luck. Um, and I would say that, oh, I just wanted to show you, I don't, I don't know how well this shows up, but this is a sample of the different meetings that we've sent students to this year. You can see that they're not only in California, but throughout the country and even throughout the world. So we support international travel as well. <clears throat> so as I said, we still have funding available for travel in May and June of this year. Um, and we just opened up the opportunity for students to apply for travel funding for the 2016-17 academic year. So that's any travel occurring July 1 or later. And um, the funding is competitive because it's somewhat limited. So the best strategy for a student is for them to know well ahead of time what meeting they want to attend and when that meeting or conference will begin accepting abstracts. So rather than wait for the deadline, which could be four to six weeks later, they should be prepared to submit their abstract as soon as that abstract submission window opens. Then once they've done that, they can turn around and apply to COAST for travel funding and we will hold their place in line while they're waiting to find out if their abstract has been accepted. So they don't have to wait even for that. They can apply to us once they've submitted their abstract. And for really popular conferences at certain times of year, that's the key to getting in line and getting your hands on the money. So it's really kind of a first come, first serve, as long as you meet all the criteria and have all the pieces in. We don't sit there and look at two different applications and decide which one is better. We don't do that. It's really kind of just where they, the timing of the whole thing. So again, if you have a student going to a meeting, you know you know hopefully well ahead of time when that meeting is. It should say on the website roughly or even the exact date on which they'll begin accepting abstracts and have your students prepared to submit their abstract then, not four to six weeks later at the dead time. So it's a great way to get your students um, up to speed on that. Okay, we also have a really strong internship program. This will be our sixth year. And I am really excited about this. This is one of the things we do that's really fantastic. And the program has grown significantly since its inception. Um, we're looking to place around 18 students this year, which is double what we placed last year. These are our hosts. We have uh, federal and state partners, a nonprofit, and a number of private companies. So it's a great opportunity for students to see what it's like to work in these environments. We take both undergrad and grad students, and about 75% of our internships are filled by undergraduate students. They get paid, which I think is important for making sure that we're able to engage students from all backgrounds and socioeconomic classes. Students get paid a $4,000 stipend for their work over the summer, and they're required to commit 400 hours. So it's basically a full-time job for 10 or 11 weeks. Lisa Wonick here will be hosting an intern this summer. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, two? Oh, third time, yes. Is it? Yeah. And she's brought in a number of other sanctuary partners as well. So we also have Greater Federal Lines, Monterey Bay, and the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary hosting interns this summer. Um, 
As to the stipend, it's been a great program because Post pays half of each student's stipend and the host contributes the other half. So the host is providing a 100% match for the money that Coast is investing in this. So I think it really shows how invested the hosts are as well in the internship program and what they get out of it. We've had a, our biggest pool of applicants to date this year, so I want to thank all of you for helping advertise this among your students, encouraging your students to apply, especially those of you who wrote letters of rec for students. Those are important. The hosts have been in the process of interviewing the students and making their choices, and a number of them have already told us how great the quality of the applicants was and that they've had a, a difficult time choosing among them, so that's a good problem to have. Uh, I also want to mention our investment in undergraduate research, which is also in its second year. So beginning in 2014-15, Coast made a decision to significantly increase its investment in undergraduate student research system-wide. So for the second year, we've now provided $2,500 to each campus specifically designed for marine, coastal, and coastal watershed research by undergraduate students. And this has been really successful. So in the first year, which was 2014-15, we supported about 75 students throughout the system. And at some campuses, the campus, either through an institute on campus or from the president, provided additional funding to match the coast funding and make the program even bigger on that campus. We don't have the numbers yet for this year, but when we checked in with all the campuses mid-year, they were on track to successfully award their funds. So we're looking forward to some really good numbers. Again, probably at least 70 students, if not closer to 100 this year. <clears throat> we had our annual Coast WRPI, which is the Water Group, student research poster reception this year, last month, here at the Chancellor's Office over in the Wallace Room. This was, Beth and I think, probably one of our best ones to date. The Chancellor was in the room for at least 45 minutes walking around talking to students um, in great detail about their work. These are Channel Island students who also have demonstration tables set up. They're looking at microplastics in marine and coastal environments, so they brought in examples. There were trustees there, so we do this meeting every year at the end of the first day of a two-day board of trustees meeting. So many of the trustees were in the room, many of the campus presidents attend this, and it's a great opportunity for the people who work really hard to run the system to actually get back in touch because I think they end up being fairly removed from it. So to have an opportunity to talk to the faculty members and the students about their research and their experience within the CSU. We also hosted an Ocean Day luncheon in Sacramento this year. Uh, I, think for the, I think this was our fifth, fifth luncheon event. So this year we chose to highlight aquaculture in California. We had Michael Lee from CSU East Bay speak along with Secretary Laird, who's the Secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency and a representative of, of the NOAA Aquaculture Program. We had close to 100 people in the room for lunch, and what we do is we use this event in Sacramento to try to engage legislators, their committee staff, and state agency staff at the state level. So I think that was really successful. <clears throat> uh, Zed mentioned our strategic plan, and um, who here is a campus rep? Okay, so if you're a campus rep, I know, you, I know you all read every single email you get from me. So you got an email from me yesterday about needing your input and your approval, hopefully, for our strategic plan. So we have drafted now our second five-year strategic plan for 2016 through 2021. Development of this plan began over a year ago in early 2015, and all of the campus, um, or all of the Coast members, I'm sorry, had a chance to comment on this plan twice during 2015, and it was the focus of the annual meeting here last year. So after taking all of that input, we then sent it to the communications department here at the chancellor's office for professional layout and graphic design, and I think it looks great. It's online. And what we need now is for the campus reps to hopefully approve this, which will allow it to go to the next step, which is to be approved by the president's council and then it will be sent on to the chancellor, hopefully, for his final approval, at which point it can become our official guiding document for our activities for the next five years. So I would say this was, um, this was definitely a labor of love. This took quite a bit of time to get it right and to really go through it and try to make sure that every detail is right in this plan. Um, the campus reps have also been asked to weigh in on our governance structure. So our governance structure was first developed in 2009 during the first year of the program, 
It was revised in 2013. And the campus representatives are the body that approves any changes to the governance structure. So as Zed said, we went through this authorization process that required us to explain some of our structure and procedures in more detail. That was a good opportunity to look at how we're doing things, write them down, uh, because they weren't actually written down in some cases, and make, make improvements where we needed to clarify things or come up with a different way of doing things. So these are just some of the changes 